and on this morning with Dr. Bill Warner, uh, founder of the, what's the title of your organization again? Center for the Study of Political Islam. Perfect. Center for the Study of uh, Political Islam. We first met last year uh, yes. out at, in Washington, D.C. at Casey McAlpin's Writer's Workshop. Got to hear a presentation on political Islam. I've seen some of your videos online, and uh, the information you present is, is fascinating. And uh, I, I like the, the way in which you go into so much detail uh, about the political side of Islam, which I don't think a lot of people hear about. Um, so, so I guess, uh, you know, kind of starting off here, how, how would you delineate between where the, the political side of Islam begins and the religious side ends? Well, I coined the term political Islam within the week after 9-11. The reason I did that was we need to be able to discuss Islam, but I'm not interested in the religion of Islam. That is what a Muslim does to go to paradise and avoid hell. Instead, what I'm interested about is how Islam impacts me, and I'm not part of the religion of Islam. And I call, I define the term of how Islam deals with the non-believer, the kafir, as being political Islam. And we need to be able to talk about politics, and I have no interest in discussing religion at all. Okay. I mean, I think it's an important designation to make um, when we're having these conversations. There's one thing you like to say is that you don't, you don't necessarily want to focus on people. You want to focus on discussing ideas. Exactly. Yeah. Because I, what I, I'm a scientist by training. And so what I see, Islam has a political theory that's laid out. And so I discuss everything in terms of Islam, what they say, that is, if I'm going to talk about slavery or whatever subject, I'm going to talk to you about it, not what a Muslim says. I'm only interested in what one Muslim says, and his name is Muhammad, the original Muhammad. Other than that, I don't, I don't discuss people because I'm not about people. Instead, I'm about ideas and how these ideas cause people to do things. So I discuss, the, if, if a Muslim does something, I don't talk about the Muslim, I talk about why he did that. It's a very different approach. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I you know, definitely respect that. And it's it's... It's kind of easy to get caught into the trap of being labeled Islamophobic and whatnot today. Um, and I think if the way you the way you separate those two things uh, in terms of focusing on the political side and the ideas versus the person kind of helps you avoid that pitfall. Because at the end of the day, you know, they're 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 good people, um, just like everybody else. It's like people of every other faith. There's um, one point seven billion Muslims. How could I possibly t talk about what they all believe and think? Exactly. I cannot. But I can read the Quran, the Sirah, the life of Muhammad, and the Hadith, and the Sharia. Those I can read. So those are, we can sort of nail those down. People, yeah. So, so what do those three books say about the Kafir? Well, first off, it's amazing how much, if we took the Quran, the Sirah, and the Hadith, and laid them on a table, you'd be amazed at one thing, which is you would look in the Quran and say, that's small compared to the Sirah, the life of Muhammad, and the Hadith, his traditions. And so, actually, only 14% of the Quran, Sirah, Hadith, which is the total theory of Islam, that is, the total doctrine of Islam, only 14% of it is found in the Quran. Think about that. The other 86% is found in the Sirah, the biography and the Hadith, his traditions. So Islam is about this much Muhammad and about this much Allah. This is the good news, because talking about God is a tricky business, but talking about people, Muhammad, straightforward. We can understand him. So, so as a political philosophy, um, I mean, I've, I've seen some of your presentations where you've documented how uh, Islam spread throughout the Middle East and, and how it, it kind of took over regions because they're thinking in different terms, they're thinking in different uh, lengths of time compared to American thinking. Can you explain uh, a little bit more about that philosophy? Uh, as Americans, we want it now. Say again? So in terms of how they, how they measure time. So we're, we're well, thinking short time. I like to say that in the West, we keep time with a watch. And in Islam, they keep time with a calendar. They make plans that are generations long. Very patient people. We have illy prepared ourselves to deal with patient people because we want it done now. Quick six weeks is as much time as we want to think about it. So Islam thinks about it in generation after generation. Let me give you an example. Turkey, which is now 99.7% Muslim, used to be all Christian when it was called Anatolia and Asia Minor. Now that process in going from Christian to Muslim took centuries. Doesn't matter. Once the, the Sharia is in place, Islam will continue to grow unless it's directly opposed. 
So they're very patient people. I have nothing but respect for the, i tell you something else Muslims do extraordinarily better than we do, strategic planning. Since they have such a long distance view, they make plans that go over generations. We can see this in the Muslim Brotherhood explanatory memo, because when it was written, we, we see it 20 years later, we can say, look, they've already checked off this point, this point, they're already doing this. Yeah. So they plan well, they're brilliant at strategy. They're, I know of no other group in the world who strategizes and plans as well as the Muslims do. So, so how does this relate to, to America today? Because you know, a lot of people have concerns, um, let's just say about the two Muslim congresswomen that just got elected to the US government and see it as some sort of Trojan horse um, to, to kind of start Islamifying the, the United States. Do you see that as being a valid concern? Well, the doctrine of Islam says that that's what they're here for. I mean, I'm not making any of this up. It, Islam is to be the one, I don't want to use the one political system in the world. That's what the Quran says. That's what the Hadith says. So I'm very concerned. Having these people in our Congress is putting the thin end of the world's longest wedge in place. It just keeps pressuring and pressuring. And remember, it doesn't matter how quickly it happens. All that matters is it will happen. So yes, we're, but stop and think about it. How long has it been since 9-11? Look how much we already have is Islamified America in terms of halal food being served in some school systems, halal food being served in prisons. So Islam is here to dominate. And that's not my word. That's their word. So, so what? Uh, I guess what verses specifically, you know, in the Quran, the Sirah, the Hadith, would actually validate what you just said? Let's take Quran verse nine twenty nine. Fight them until basically they obey the Sharia and pay the poll tax. Fight them until the Sharia is in place. That's basically what the verse says. So that's just an example of that. There are other. Hadith, which say that I've been ordered to wage war until there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet is recognized everywhere. And that is the statement of becoming a Muslim. So it's clearly laid like out. Everybody else ag agrees with you. Fight until everybody else is, is Islamic. The entire world is exactly in, in Islamic world. Is that is that kind of what I'm hearing? Yeah. Huh. Okay. How do you think how do you think that Turkey went from being all Christian to basically all Muslim? That was not an accident. As a matter of fact, it's true in all the countries. Egypt used to be Islam, uh, Christian. North Africa used to be Christian. Afghanistan used to be Buddhist. Pakistan used to be Hindu. Now then, find me any Buddhism in Afghanistan. I don't think so. So no matter whether, where they go, Islam, over enough time, centuries, they dominate completely. So, so if what you're saying is correct, I mean, I guess <clears throat> there, there seems like there might be actual cause for concern here in America with our political systems on a national level and locally, um, when you look at areas that have, have high concentrations of people with Islamic faith who are, who are working their way into politics. So if what you're saying is correct, and this is part of a long-term strategic plan, then I guess what would we need to do to, to counter that? You know, I claim that Muslims running for office is a grand opportunity. Well, we need, because right now it's difficult to get a forum in which you can actually discuss Islam. But once Muslims run for office, we can be ask them any question. So I think that we should be able to, when, every, when a Muslim is a candidate, he knows that when he shows up at a political rally, there's going to be people there with brochures, signs, and questions. He knows that's going to happen because it's happening to him every time they show up. So we need to you take this opportunity to ask questions about Islam, which we want to explain clearly. So I see it as a golden opportunity. By the way, one of the reasons that Muslims get elected to office is, is that good meaning, well-meaning people say, well, you know, I think that we ought to elect a Muslim to the school board just because we've never had one. So we get this tokenism idea. Mm. But I think that should become an opportunity to thoroughly explore what are this candidate's real intentions with regards to the Sharia. Mm -hmm. I think you see office as a, running for office as a political opportunity to ask embarrassing questions, frankly. So, so, I mean, obviously you're going to get some sort of claims of, of xenophobia by making statements like that. And, and with these type of ideas, even though they, they may be true. So um, I guess to put a, a finer point on it, are there conflicts between Islam and Sharia and the U.S. Constitution? Are you able to be a, a, devout, uh, a devout Muslim who adheres to all tenets of Islam and also 
be able to represent the, the American people based on the, the, the principles of the U.S. Constitution. Let's talk about one of the principles of the U.S. Constitution, which is <clears throat> Article 6. Article 6 says that the Constitution is the highest law in the land. Mm -hmm. I mean, it clearly states that. But the Sharia says that it is the highest law in the land, in, in the world, not just the land, but in the world. Why? Because the Sharia is Allah's law. Okay. So therefore, it is higher than our law. So now then we have a contradiction built into the oath of office, which is which law will you, will you use? Will you use the Sharia or will you use the U.S. Constitution? And so that, that is the major conflict. Let, let's, take a, but let's make it much, much, much smaller. Let's take the idea of wife beating. Let's talk about something which is physical and everybody, they don't need to read a book on wife beating. Mm -hmm. The Quran says that a Muslim may beat his wife. The Sharia says that a Muslim may beat his wife and gives detailed rules on how to do it. The Hadith says that a Muslim can beat his wife. And I don't recall any wife beating in the Sirah. So here we have, though, that wife beating is part of Islam. It is sanctioned in the Sharia, the Quran, and the Hadith. So if you're a politician and you're a Muslim, I want to know where you stand on that. Does a Muslim have the right to beat his wife or not? Because your law, Sharia says it is. So this is an example of bringing things down to a very fine point, and let's discuss something we can all understand, wife beating. Fair enough. Hey, I want to get to, because this is kind of segueing in with, with some questions that I've received. So some of my followers sent me some questions to ask you. And Let's do it. As far as uh, just having a better understanding on this topic. So I'm hoping to, to read off a few of these and, and have you provide some, some responses for them. Um, so the first question is, when it comes to homosexuals, does Islam believe in reformation or extermination? <laughs> <laughs> well, we started off with a tough one. Well, what it says is, is that they can be thrown off the top of tall buildings. Uh, there's a weak hadith which says that homosexuality th shakes the throne of Allah, and it's condemned in the hadith. So, now, I th as I recall, to put a fine point on it, I don't think women who are homosexual are supposed to be killed. I think they're supposed to be locked away until they finally say, okay, I'm over that. I'm not so sure about that last point. I may get corrected after this is over. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll check the comments. You probably will. <laughs> but you might be correct, though. I don't know. I mean, it, it's. I read these stories because there was a there, there was a story not too long ago. I think within the last two years, of uh, gay men who literally were thrown off the roofs of buildings overseas. It's like it. It. it, it what I find astounding is that the, the left in America goes to bat so hard for the religion of Islam. And at the same time, they say they champion the LGBTQ agenda. And those two philosophies are at complete odds with each other. Does that, does that make sense? So, yeah. So I, I, yeah. Don't, I don't understand how, how, they, uh, how they're able to, to rationalize being able to support both positions at, at the same time. Can, can you find, is, is there any thought that you've put into this in terms of how it's, it's possible that you say you love gay people and gay rights, and yet you support an ideology that's beyond repressive, that literally murders them just for being who they are. I don't have an answer for this, but I've asked the same question. I mean, let's go beyond homosexuality. Let's go, let's go back to the wife beating. Yeah. I find me a leftist who thinks, who will state in public, yes, it's okay to beat your wife. I don't think you'll find one. And yet they support a doctrine of wife beating when they support Islam. Yep. Maybe. What? Maybe Keith Ellison. <laughs> oh, that was wicked. <laughs> too soon? But anyway. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> that's okay. So I don't understand the left at all on this issue. I mean, where are you on this? Yeah. Are you for gays being killed? Are you for women being beaten? And I mean, I don't get it. I mean, you've exposed a big contradiction, which no one has an answer to. Yeah. Except I'll tell you what. We... I, I pride myself in saying I'm a rational man, but I'm probably not as rational as I think. I think the human being is capable of creating little partitions in their brain and saying, you know, well, I'm in this crowd, I'm this way, and in this crowd, I'm the other way. But it is a contradiction. That is for sure. So um, let's see. Another question here. Uh, ooh. Uh, why does the Quran talk about waging jihad on unbelievers? Well, first off, let's cover what the word jihad means. Jihad means struggle or effort. 
So there's all kinds of jihad in the sense of it can be manifested in different ways. Now, let me quickly address the so-called greater jihad, which is the inner struggle, the inner religious struggle. This indeed is mentioned in the hadith, but if you take all the had, let's if you take all the hadith description of jihad, which is 21% of it, which is about 1400 hadiths traditions about jihad, less than 2% of them discuss jihad as being inner struggle. Instead, the other 98% discuss jihad as killing the kafir. So let's get that straight. But jihad is clearly laid out in the Quran. It's clearly laid out in the Sirah, the life of Muhammad. And it's clearly laid out in the Hadith. We need to understand something. Muhammad preached the religion of Islam for 13 years in Mecca and converted about 150 people. That's not many people. Then he went to Medina, actually was driven out of Mecca, went to Medina where he became a politician and a jihadist. And when he died, every Arab in the Saudi Peninsula, what we now call Saudi Peninsula, was a Muslim. So therefore we see the reason that jihad is practiced is it works. Mm. So I guess what I, what I hear you saying is that there's a, uh, you could say there's a, uh, not necessarily a plan laid out, but there's uh, consequences for Kafirs and basically by any means necessary, it, it, it's okay to maybe deceive Kafirs or uh, mm -hmm. use any techniques you deem necessary to push the, the faith or the political ideology forward. Is that a fair statement? It is indeed fair. And by the way, the practice of jihad is very subtle. It doesn't have to be just like 9-11. It can be not allowing gummy bears into the school system because they have pork gelatin in them. Mm. So jihad is practiced in many ways. Let me throw this in. 21% of the Quran written in Medina is about jihad. This is not a verse or two. It is a systemic doctrine. So you're saying that there's basically already jihad being waged here in the United States, because we have policies that are going in place in, in like you just mentioned, in, in certain school systems. Yes. Where, uh, pork is allowed to be served and, and accommodations are being made based on faith. Would that be a type of jihad? Yes, it is. As a matter of fact, let me say this. The Muslim Brotherhood, which practices primarily the nonviolent jihad, although they're totally open to it, mm -hmm. the Muslim Brotherhood is far more dangerous to the United States than al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, or uh, the Taliban. How so? Because, let's just look, if, if, you're talking about, <clears throat> if you're talking about jihad as a violent effort, how many people do we lose a year in, in jihad in America? Less than drunk driving. Now, this is not to try to gloss over those 3,000 people who died on 9-11. I'm not glossing over that, but I'm just saying, as a nation, we lose more people that in armed combat. Mm -hmm. So, whereas the Muslim Brotherhood keeps grinding away at the rights that we have as human beings, one of those being the ability to speak about Islam. I read a paper that's being prepared, it was by the, uh, London, by the English parliamentary system in which they talk about Islamophobia. They're talking about criminalizing people such as myself. That is, instead of being irritated by what I say, People like myself, and this is in England, but it's, it's ahead of us about 20 years. They want to make it such that I could be sent to prison because if I just have this conversation with you now, because what they say is, is that free speech should be limited by not harming someone. And if a Muslim is uncomfortable with what you say about him, he is being harmed. Yeah, I see that as part of a, a, a kind of a wider assault by the left on the First Amendment. You know, yes. we, we see that across college campuses in the United States. Oh where words uh, are microaggressions, by labeling it a microaggression, it's actually an actionable offense. So th they perceive that real harm has been done to them. Therefore, in their mind, they're, they're justified in using actual force against you. <laughs> I was raised in an entirely different set of framework. I was raised to be tough. That is, if you insult me, it's like water off a duck's back. So I'm... Uh, when I went off to college, and I was raised in deep country, okay, one of the biggest thrills for me in going off to college was there was a running water and we had a shower. I didn't have running water until I went off to college. I mean, that's how far back in the woods I was. <laughs> but I was excited to go to college to hear new ideas, yeah. ideas that I may not agree with. Yeah. But I wanted to learn about them, debate about them, argue about them, understand them. 
And now then it appears that universities will give you a written guarantee that nothing will be said in this college that will offend anybody. Yeah. Whoa. Which is impossible because, I mean, Yay. somebody's going to be offended by something. Yes. Because you, just because somebody's offended, it doesn't mean you said something offensive. Or if it, I have... Who gets, to, who gets to, to define language is the ultimate question. Who's the ultimate arbiter of what is acceptable and what's unacceptable? Uh, and I think that's, the, that's the, the scary nature of the, the direction we're headed in. Again, we see it across Europe already. Tommy Robinson... Uh, you know, was jailed on a similar principle just for just for videotaping outside of a courthouse, something right. they didn't want broadcast. So hopefully uh, that stays there and doesn't spread to the United States. But y you can start to see elements of that kind of creeping into our culture. I think, um, honestly, I think the election of President Trump kind of staved some of that off to where, uh, you know, it kind of slowed the pace down. Right. That, that we were moving toward, you know, a, a dr draconian hellhole. Um, but you know, uh, there's we have the uh, the new extension being put into Microsoft, uh, the Microsoft software, the the news the news filter. Yeah, and it's it's automatically filtering out, you know, sites that it deems fake news based on whatever criteria they set, and and it specifically targets conservative sites only. Meanwhile, you know, these sites like CNN, uh, HuffPo, sites that completely botched three of the biggest stories of the year so far last week alone are all ranked at the highest rating as real news. It, it's incredible to watch. I think that without freedom of speech, we're no longer really human beings. So I mean, that's, I, yeah, I, mean, I, think that it, I think it is our most basic fundamental right. Yeah. If you don't have free speech, what does freedom of the press mean? If we don't have free speech, what does freedom of religion mean? If we don't have free speech, what is the ability to, any of those freedoms we have, Without free speech, they're nothing. They're nada. They're zip. Yeah, there's. The and I don't want my news filtered. Uh, Give it to me raw. What's that? I said I don't want my news filtered. Give it to me raw. I can take yeah. it. Yeah, it's like we. It's like we had this. Uh, we had this. This nanny state, where they think mm. adults aren't capable of of making their own decisions and finding their own information. That they have to have everything spoon fed to them. So is it really just a paternal? I guess the question I have is, is it, and you don't have to answer this. This is just going through my head. Is it more of a paternalistic attitude toward the people they represent? Or is it really an agenda to try to dumb everybody down and push something else? I'm and for the latter. The fence. And, and maybe it's a little bit of both. I mean, two things can be true at the same time. But anyway, I don't want. I was raised by my grandmother who said exactly what she thought. And I'm her son. And so I say exactly what I think. I try to be kind to people, but on the other hand, I'm not a timid person. And I don't want the state coming to my door and saying, shut up. Right. So I'm going to get back to some of these questions here. Uh, okay. Can true Islam ever be at peace with the non-Muslims? That's a good question. Well, the scriptures say no. Pete, here's the view of Islam. We like to think that the state... That is, the relationship between countries is based on peace and it veers off into a bad space war. Mm -hmm. That war is, is the abnormal and peace is the normal. Islam doesn't have that. It says there shall be war until the peace of Islam comes. Islam is a peaceful religion, but only after you submit to the Sharia. Once everyone is submitted to the Sharia, there will be world peace. So says Islam. Meanwhile, in Sharia countries, you have women getting stoned to death after they're raped. So that doesn't sound very peaceful. <laughs> no. Uh, another question here. Does Islamist religion really call for death and violence to those who oppose their beliefs? Well, let's take a day in the life of Muhammad. One day he said to someone, who will kill Mar Marwan's daughter who has offended Allah and his prophet? And so she was assassinated. Then who will offend, who will... Uh, take care of Kaaba bin Ashraf, who was offended Allah and his prophet. So he was assassinated. Mm -hmm. Then there was another case in which Muhammad had an argument with the Jews of Medina, and he sat beside his wife Aisha as they worked into the night killing 800 Jews. The women were sold into slavery. The, women, the, the children were adopted as Muslims into Muslim families, and 800 Jews were killed by beheading. So those are three examples of Muhammad's life. Judge for yourself. We go. Um, <laughs> let's see. Are women in Islamic countries allowed to have social media like Instagram? 
Say again, I didn't understand. So are, are women in Islamic countries allowed to have social media accounts like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter? Ah, well, they seem to. That's the first time I've been asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it would depend on how thoroughly. You see, a woman is not even supposed to go outside of the house without a, a mar- an unmarriageable male guardian. Mm. Now, that's under its strictest. That is not usually obeyed here in the United States, but in Saudi Arabia, it is. Okay. So... Yeah, Saudi, in Saudi Arabia, women just started driving within the last two years, right? Yes, yes. So the point I'm making is if a woman can't go outside of the house because she might cause illicit thoughts with somebody, mm-hmm. then why would she want to be on social media? That's outside the house. But I don't know. Yeah. It's an interesting question. Okay. Um, let's see. Hmm. Is it frowned upon if an elected official of Islamic faith takes a picture with the American flag? First, let's establish something. A Muslim may do anything that will advance Islam. Okay. As a matter of fact, uh, the Sharia requires, if, dis- if lying is necessary to advance what is good and proper and right in Islam, then it is mandatory to lie. So therefore, what I do is, instead of looking at what a Muslim does or says, I look at the doctrine that he's supposed to be referring to. Mm-hmm. You see the difference here? Yeah. And that actually takes care of the next question, too. Okay. Which, Two for one. Line is permitted in Islam and under what circumstances? So um, the answer sounds like it's in, under any circumstances where the, the goal is to advance now, Islam. They're supposed to tell the truth if the truth will advance Islam. Okay. So this is, this is part of the process of taqiyya, sacred deception. By the way, when I first heard about taqiyya, sacred mm-hmm. deception, I was like, what? Wait, can you explain more about that? Well, taqiyya is lying to advance Islam or deceiving to advance Islam. Okay. Uh, and by the way, you've heard of the 99 names of Allah? I haven't, no. Well, anyway, uh, Allah has 99 names. Okay. In one of the verses, Allah says, I am the greatest of deceivers. Hmm. And when I read that, I was like, what? God would deceive me? What? 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 <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, well, I mean, I, I guess it's, uh, I'm learning a lot here about, about what the scriptures actually say, and, and, and from a political, from a political standpoint, it does make a little bit more sense to hear you say those type of things, um, again, because there's, there's an agenda that's more than just about worshiping a deity. Yes, if, if Islam were a religion, I'd be in the workshop this morning, and we would not be having this concert, conversation. So uh, another question here. Do Muslims believe Sharia laws trumps the government's laws in the United States? Yes. Okay, asked and answered. That was the short. We kind of dealt with that earlier, (laughs) Article 6. Because the Sharia is God's law. I mean, why would you want to obey man's law, what you and I would say, when you could do what Allah's law is? Mm -hmm. Makes sense. I'm just not so sure who Allah is. Okay. Um, Another question. So where do you see where do you see Islam in terms of growth in the United States over the next 40 years? Like a wildfire. Very rapid. It's growing faster and faster. It's also growing faster everywhere in the in Europe as well. It's not that it's staying on a constant speed. It's it is still accelerating. Mm -hmm. So so what do you think is responsible for that? Does it does it have to do more with population growth? people having more kids or do you think maybe it has to do with the the decline of Christianity and, and fewer people identifying as as Christians I mean what, what do you think is the main driver of that explosion of growth well we have I guess three forms there's migration there's conversion and then there's birth now Muslims do have a lot of kids as a matter of fact they're commanded to have a lot of kids for the soul for the purpose of expanding Islam okay. so the womb Muhammad was the greatest genius of war who ever lived. He was able to take a headscarf and make it into a weapon of war. He was able to take food and make it into a weapon of war. So everything that Islam can use and can be a, a weapon of war, mm. a, pressure, a way to pressure the kafir. All right. Um, let's see. A couple other ones here. Oh, so... Someone asked me, uh, okay, th- their daughter is curious as to what the draw is for women to Islam. 
Excellent question. Let's deal with the feminization of the American male. Let's just start with that. Mm -hmm. When I say that, does that have meaning to you? Uh, this day and age, absolutely. <laughs> well, let's say you're a woman and you want a masculine man. Yeah. Islam is a place to find such a person. So that's one thing. Let's also, let's also say that you're a woman and you want to have a family and you want to be a housewife and you want a husband who will bring you home food and basically take care of you. You want to be a mother. Islam almost guarantees that. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the United States now, to find somebody who wants to marry, I'm not talking about a good time on Saturday night. Okay, I'm talking about being married and having those responsibilities. And let yeah. me say, under fair disclosure, I'm a father and a grandfather. Right. So, if you're a woman who wants a husband, yeah. Islam's got him. Yeah. So those are purposes. Those are, uh, and like I say, the, the husband is commanded to have a family and to bring home a paycheck and take care of the wife. So these are pluses. And by the way, may I say that in the black community, it's even more that way. If you want a black man who is, if you want a male who's black and who wants to be a father, go down to the mosque. They got him by the yard. Hmm. All right. Um, a couple other questions here. So, should Americans be scared? Um, are they are they hoping to change or convert the entire country? Someone well, like they want to change it. The conversion process takes centuries, but they definitely want to change it. They want it to become more and more Sharia compliant in little small ways. One, you know how thin they slice salami? That's the method of Sharia, just a thin slice at a time. It's in incremental steps. Just very small. Yeah. Don't create any panic or alarm. Right. Uh, another question here. Do you think there's, you think there's possibility for peace in Gaza? No. I mean, that's the century-old century yeah, battle, right? Not, by the way, that fight did not start in 19... I always have trouble with Israel founded in 47 or 48. 48. I don't know why I have that. 48. December, this December problem 12th, did not... Yeah. Hmm? December 12th, 48, something like that? I think it is. Yeah. But anyway, that's not when this problem started. The problem started 1,400 years ago. Okay. With, when, with what? When Muhammad subjugated the Jews of Arabia. <clears throat> So that's where the problem is. <clears throat> there is a definite Jew hatred. There's more Jew hatred in the Quran, the Sir, and the Hadith than there is in Mein Kampf. I've measured it. Wow. So therefore, if, if Allah don't like the Jews, why would you expect the rest of the Muslims to like the Jews? So, so just to, to clarify again, so you're saying there's more criticism of the Jews in the three holy books of Islam than there was in the, the writings and philosophies of Adolf Hitler. I'm just referring to Mein Kampf as a book. Okay, okay. that's all I'm measuring it is. What okay. happened was, is I, I sat down and I read Mein Kampf, and every paragraph that had any sort of slur of the Jews, I just checked it off. Mm -hmm. and so then I went through and did the same thing with the Quran, the Sirah, and the Hadith. Okay. And there's simply more Jew hatred in those three books than there is in Mein Kampf. And this is going to sound kind of peculiar. It's better Jew hatred. That is, it's more vicious than that you find in Mein Kampf. Surprised, aren't you? Um, yeah, actually. Yeah, okay. I was surprised as well. I mean, we might, we might have to do a whole video just on that. A <laughs> <laughs> um, couple other questions here. Let's see. Ooh, why is it why is it okay to ignore the fact that Muhammad was a pedophile? I don't think it's okay at all. I do not call him a pedophile. Let me teach you my method. I say that Muhammad married Aisha when she was six and consummated the marriage when she was nine. Stop. You draw your own conclusions. Fair enough. Uh, Do you see my here. method? <laughs> Does Islam encourage marriage with your first cousin? It says it's permissible. It doesn't encourage it, it just says it's permissible. Okay. This is, a, this is, if you will, a sin against future generations because constant inbreeding has bad effects. And as a matter of fact, I'll give you an example here in, in the United States. Here in Nashville, Tennessee, we have Vanderbilt University, which has heavy funding from the House of Saud on genetic diseases. Okay. So, no, inbreeding is not good. Yeah, we see it uh, in countries like Pakistan, uh, 
uh, Pakistan, what's the other country that has, there are a few countries over in the, in the Middle East that have uh, as high as pop, as high numbers, oh, I can't talk today, as high numbers as like 70% um, of, of interfamily marriage. Yes. And I mean, do you see that? So let me ask you this, um, and I might, I might, you know, catch some flack for this, but does that... <laughs> You're going to catch <laughs> flack for talking to me. <laughs> True story. I'm going to be on that SP, SPLC list now. <laughs> right. I can give you a recommendation if you need it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'll find me. <laughs> no, but seriously, so uh, does that, does, does, the, does the inbreeding aspect play into what we see as far as terrorist attacks and suicide bombings and these extremes that people go through and enforcing their version of that political ideology or their version of jihad? Well, now let's say that you need a you need a, somebody to strap on a dynamite vest and go blow themselves up, and that all Muslims can do this. But who's going to be the easiest to persuade? Someone yeah. with an IQ of 130 or someone with an IQ of 65? Yeah. I mean, let's just be practical here. Yeah. Um, another couple quick questions, and then we'll kind of we'll kind of wrap it up. Um, let's see. This one's already you've already answered. Uh, already answered. Okay. This is this is a good one. So, what do what do what do Muslims believe that is different from Islamic extremists? Ah. Uh, now, what do you mean when you say extremist? You're uh, probably thinking of somebody. I'm, no, no, I'm no. Gonna, no. Well, I'm, this is not my question, but I'm I'm going right. to guess that we're 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 talking specifically your. Your ISIS types, your, your, yes. your terrorists, yes. terrorist attackers who are going to, you know, blow up people or be, line up Christians and behead them on a beach. Yeah. Or like That's what you mean by an extremist. Right? Morocco just a couple of weeks ago and one of them was beheaded and they were just trying to, they were just on a hiking trip. Right. You call that extremism? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because you're using your own. I think chopping off somebody's head is a bit extreme. <laughs> you're using your own ethical system there. Okay. Okay, for you, that's unethical. It's immoral what they're doing. But that's because you're using your morality. Mm. Now then, Islamic State, which is headed up by al-Baghdadi, al-Baghdadi, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, okay. they are exquisite scholars on the, on the doctrine of Islam. And when they talk about this, they use the, what they measure for extremism is not what yours is, but what the Quran and the Sirah and the Hadith lay out. Well, it turns out that what they're doing is what Muhammad did. Let's take sex slaves, for instance, mm -hmm. which is an abhorrent to me. I call that, you would call that extremism. But Muhammad had sex slaves. Now, who is the normal, who is the pattern for behavior in Islam? Muhammad. So if Muhammad did something, that defines it as being normal. Right, but can't, so can't we make the argument that if you have a culture where that is normal, and, and we're just on different different wavelengths in terms of uh, societal norms. Wouldn't you be wouldn't you be able to credibly make the case that that society is completely incompatible with Western society? Thank you. You got it. <laughs> Get an A for the course. <laughs> but yeah, for them, it's for them. It's not. It's within the bounds. Like yeah. oh, let's let's take another car. He's driving a car at extreme speed. Does that mean driving it at 200 miles an hour on the interstate? Well, no, if you're driving 35 miles an hour in a school zone, that is extremely fast. Yeah. yeah. So it, we need to understand when we say normal or when we say extreme or radical, mm -hmm. what are we using to measure that with? Sure. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, we kind of, yeah. I mean, the, the benchmark matters and it, it's, it's uh, you know, Perfect it's, a, word. it's a case of, of relativism, but I think it's something that we have to kind of spend a little bit more time evaluating as a country, and it's hard to do because, as you mentioned before, it's hard to ha even have honest conversations on this topic without having your, your video pulled or without being labeled xenophobic. And, and, and you know, it's just if we could get to a point where we could have real discussion, we might be able to, to, to kind of make some headway on on addressing these issues or at least delaying concerns that people have and trying to find some some sort of middle ground and find a way where we can get to a point where maybe we can have it be compatible with. American society here, but wouldn't that require a little bit of a assimilation? It would require changing. It would require, it would require changing the Quran. It would require changing the Sharia. It would, it would require changing the Hadith, and it would require changing the Sirah. 
Those are immutable. So the so there the, so there really is no way no. to fully assimilate into Western no. culture, American society, a constitutional no. republic, and ad, be a strict adherent to the three holy books. Is that what I hear you saying? That's exactly correct. Okay. That's the bottom line. All right. You see, the SPLC is going to be knocking on your door tonight. <laughs> I'm not hard to find, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I, I deal with worse. I mean, have you seen my Twitter feed lately? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do one more question. Uh, so why do Muslims that get elected into office swear on the Quran rather than the Bible? Well, first off, we need to be clear. There's no rule for you to put your hand on anything. It's just, it's a personal oath you take. Yeah. So Bible, Quran, to kill a mockingbird, mm -hmm. whatever. Okay. You, you don't have to use any of them. So that's, but I like it because when they do that, at least it kind of pushes the issue in our face. Yeah. Which is what I like. Because I, look, I want to talk about all this. And I think these discussions are fascinating. Yeah, I've learned a lot from your work. I really have. Um, and I think, yeah, the more conversations we have about these topics, the, the, the more we can try to try to work toward a resolution in one way or another, because right. these, these are questions that are, are pressing on people's minds right now. And a lot of people are too afraid to ask. A lot of people are too afraid to come out and, and state their true positions or state their fears because of being uh, the fear of being labeled, you know, xenophobic and, and having to deal Racist, with hater, big and Islamophobe. Huh? Racist, hater, bigot, Islamophobe. It's just exactly. one word. Yeah. <laughs> all, the, all the above. All the uh, above. Dr. Warner, thank you for your time. It was a pleasure talking with you again. Um, where can people find your work? Politicalislam.com. I've also got a YouTube channel called Political Islam. So uh, check it out. By the way, I sell books, but they're not really books. They're part of a structured learning system. Anyone can sit down and if they have the ability to read at the level of a sophomore in high school, you can, in going through these different levels and stages of my training system, you can learn all these things for yourself. Now, didn't you, uh, didn't you also have a version of the Quran that you specifically? Yeah, I, I publish a Quran. I publish three of them. And what's different about yours? Well, mine you can read and understand. Let's just start with that difference. Which Is that a big difference? Yes, it is. What I've done is, is I took the Quran and put it in the right time order. Because the Quran you buy from the bookstore starts off with the longest chapter and goes to the shortest chapter. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So we start, with, we start with the first chapter and go to the last chapter, and then it's like, ooh, now it begins to make sense. Then I took an integrated Muhammad's life into it, like this. Now I use different fonts. I don't say that Muhammad, you, you can look at the page and go, oh, that's Muhammad, that's the Allah. But therefore, Muhammad gives the verses meaning. There's an example. There was a verse in the Quran which says it was okay to burn the palm trees. Mm -hmm. And if you're reading the Quran that you got at the bookstore, you're going, palm trees? What palm trees? Who's palm trees? Why are we talking about palm trees? But if you integrate Muhammad's life into that verse, it's like the last week before he had attacked these Jews and he couldn't take, drive them out of their fortress. They were date palm farmers, so he cut down and burned their date palms. Mm. That violated Arab war law. All cultures have rules of war. Mm -hmm. Well, this violated the Arab code of war. And so they said, Muhammad, you're, you're a bad person. Well, Allah delivers a verse which says it was okay to burn the palm trees. So in my Quran, when you read burning the palm trees, you're already set up for the punch, which is Muhammad burned the palm trees last week. So mine integrates Muhammad into it, and it is very easy to understand. Anybody can read it. By the way, I do not recommend starting with reading the Quran anyway. Start with the life of Muhammad. It's a fantastic book. Spies, counter spies, tortures, death, war, assassins. I'm serious. It's a fabulous read. It's like, it's like a John Wick movie. Yes. <laughs> Awesome, man. Well, Dr. Warner, again, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, wishing you all the best. Stay safe in those streets out there. I know they're probably going to try to dox you after you get another sleep. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, thank you for having the courage to ask questions. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, a lot of, you know, people were asking me questions, so I figured why not just talk to the expert? Right. And you know, I was very fascinated by your, your presentation. I'm fascinated by your, your videos on YouTube. Hopefully people watching 
if you have additional questions or uh, want to try to fact check anything Dr. Warner said, you'll, you'll go investigate for yourself because I think you're going to find out that everything that Dr. Warner has presented is completely unassailable. So again, thank you for your time and I hope you- Oh, thank you. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye.